Hi guys, it's Debbie, and today I'm here to give you a super easy explanation of Christopher Nolan's new film, Tenet. Of course, this video will be one big spoiler. So if you haven't seen the film yet, I wouldn't recommend watching this video, but I would rather suggest watching my completely spoiler-free review of the film I had done back at the time. Now let's get right into the explanation as there is a lot to talk about. The main idea behind the film is that at some point in the future, people have figured out a way to invert the entropy of objects. This is shown in the film with examples of guns recapturing bullets instead of firing them, objects jumping back into hands instead of being dropped, cars and ships moving backwards, fire becoming ice, some people actually invert themselves in order to travel to the past. This discovery is very dangerous as it goes against the natural flow of the world and the more objects are inverted, the more unstable an environment will become. In addition to this, inverted objects can be deadly. For example, a wound from an inverted bullet is way more dangerous than a regular one and because of the radiations, the death sets on pretty quickly. Now that's just a bullet. Imagine what a huge inverted nuclear weapon could do. But the worst part comes when a scientist not only discovers how to invert objects, but she comes up with an algorithm, a set of instructions, which could invert the whole world. That means that everything that has ever lived would be destroyed instantly. Of course, after her discovery, she is very worried that information can end up in the wrong hands. So she splits the algorithm into different parts, the interlocking blocks you can see throughout the film, and hides them in different places in the past where nobody could find them. And to be on the safe side, she also commits suicide. But as in every story, there is a villain. Another group of people decide to track down these pieces. They want to find them and use them to destroy their past. One of their reasons is that we depleted our world of natural resources. We killed our environment. So their world in the future is practically dying because of climate change. And they believe that to fix that outcome, they should just destroy their past. And here enters one of the film's many paradoxes the grandfather paradox. Um, if they kill us in the past, aren't they killing themselves in the future? After all, we're their ancestors. We'll get to this and many other paradoxes later on in this video. For now, just remember a group of people in the future are desperately trying to find pieces of the algorithm hidden in the past. This team eventually decides to assign the job to evil Russian millionaire Sato, who at the time was just a poor kid sifting through radioactive ruins in order to earn some money with nothing to lose. He works for this future team, looking for the pieces of algorithm, and in exchange they send back information and bars of gold. There are certain specific times and places where he can find them. But at some point in the future, another team is created in order to stop this world-destroying mission. The team is called Tenet, and it is founded by the protagonist. And they basically use the same time-traveling techniques but for good purposes. Now, after approximately 30 years of searching and inverting and fighting, Sato has nearly found all the pieces of the algorithm. There's just one missing. And one of his attempts to get his hands on it is the attack at the Kiev Opera House. The attack at the Opera House is a disaster on all sides. The piece of the algorithm ends in the hands of Ukrainian criminals, Sato returns home empty-handed, and the protagonist team is caught, tortured, and murdered. The protagonist is kept for last, he is tortured for hours in order to obtain information, and he eventually manages to swallow a suicide pill in order to escape the situation. But surprise, surprise, in the film, the CIA don't actually use real suicide pills, and the protagonist survives. The CIA is proud of his sacrifice, but the protagonist doesn't really want to return in that line of work because of the trauma and because of his team being basically wiped out. But because of his courage, determination and skills, he is eventually asked to work for Tenet, the team trying to defeat Sato. Now, bear in mind, the protagonist is the person who will actually create Tenet in the future. He just doesn't know it yet. The protagonist accepts this new position and starts researching the concept of inversion and the damage it could cause. One of the starting points of his investigation is analysing the um, inverted objects that have been found. For example, he is able to retrace an inverted bullet back to India, where one large arms dealer has control over the market. On the trip to India, he is paired with Neil, another agent who seems to know a little too much about him. Now, Neil knows so much about him 
because he secretly knows him. He's worked with him for years, just the protagonist doesn't know it yet. Neil and the protagonist meet the arms dealer, Priya, who explains that she did sell weapons to Sato, but at the time they were regular arms, he inverted them later on. She explains that Sato is a dangerous Russian-British guy, and she recommends asking the British Secret Services for, for help. So the protagonist travels to England, where he meets with someone who we can only assume is a high-ranking spy, who says that the only way to get to Sato is through his wife. Because in addition to being a ruthless criminal, Sato is also a big meanie in his personal life, especially towards his wife Kat, and his anger towards her spiked when she accidentally let him pay millions of dollars for a fake painting. Now, Sato is not too bothered about the money, apparently he spent more than that on their last holiday, but he's furious for feeling tricked, and instead of dealing with the situation through legal paths or other paths, he just has another excuse to bully his wife, blackmail her, and estrange her from their son. And after years of living in this situation, Kat has reached the point of exasperation, and she represents the weak link to Sato. To get close to Kat, the protagonist pretends to be a wealthy art connoisseur. Uh, upon meeting him, Kat immediately realises he's not who he claims to be, but at the same time she feels safe in his presence, and something definitely sparks between them. To convince Kat to be on their side, Neil and the protagonist promise they will destroy the incriminating painting. The painting is locked away inside a freeport, which is basically a super safe warehouse where people can keep their precious belongings without paying tax. Neil and the protagonist pretend to be interested in using the freeport, they check it out and come up with a huge plan. Basically every room in the freeport is sealed, and if a fire breaks out, a gas is released because water would damage the objects. Also, in case of a fire, the electronic door system um, resets to manual mode. It sort of blacks out and the doors become just regular ones you can pick at. So to set off the fire and distract everybody from them snooping around the freeport, Neil and the protagonist come up with the idea of a huge plane driven into one of the hangars, setting off the fire they need and the Freeport workers will be too distracted trying to save the cargo, uh, in this case gold bars. So Neil and the protagonist go to the Freeport as fake customers, plane crashes, fire starts, gas starts to leak, but they hold their breath and manage to pick their way to the centre of the Freeport. Now at the centre of the Freeport they don't find the painting, but they do find a nod door. Now, uh, we later discover that this door is a, a turnstile, one of the many doorways that Sato uses to uh, invert people. A person goes through on one side, comes out inverted on the other. As a matter of fact, while they're looking at this door, a figure runs out, attacks them, and manages to get away, even thanks to Neil urging the protagonist not to shoot him. We will later discover who this figure was, but for now the plan in the Freeport is an absolute disaster. A huge fire, no painting. The painting wasn't in the Freeport because Sato removed it after he had a feeling, which probably means somebody from the future gave him the tip. After all, if somebody from the future could warn us about uh, upcoming disasters, we would probably look out for them. Anyway, of course, Kat is even sadder, Sato laughs off her attempt to, to stop him, and she feels even more helpless. The protagonist meets again with Priya, the arms dealer, who suggests that in order to get close to Sato, he should offer to help him retrieve plutonium, uh, a dangerous substance. Now bear in mind, Sato uses the word plutonium every time he is referring to his business with the future and with inversion. Basically, every time you hear plutonium two for one, just think another piece of the algorithm. The protagonist still doesn't know all the details about the algorithm. He knows Sato is communicating with the future, he knows he's probably not dealing with plutonium, but rather something that has to do with inversion and the future, but he still doesn't know all the details of it. Following Priya's recommendation, the protagonist tries to get closer to Sato. Him and Kat come up with the, the idea of pretending to be lovers, again there is a spark between them, um, in order to trigger Sato's ego and jealousy which would result in a confrontation. The plan works and although the protagonist is threatened multiple times, Sato eventually gets curious, especially when a reference to the opera house is brought up in a conversation. Kat instead in the meanwhile is always more depressed, and she eventually loses her patience and one day while out parasailing tries to kill Sato by pushing him off a boat. The protagonist saves him and explains to Kat that Sato mustn't die and that the mission 
is much bigger than what she believes. At this point, Sato still despises the protagonist, but he does feel a little grateful for him saving his life and starts to open more, open up more about his past and about his involvement with plutonium. Um, and he eventually agrees to work together with the protagonist. He asks him to retrieve some plutonium, which is being smuggled in Tallinn, Estonia. They all go to Tallinn, where Sato stays in a free port, complete with turnstile, and where he proceeds to bully and further threaten his wife. In the meanwhile, Neil and the protagonist go to retrieve the plutonium in a huge car chase high situation. They manage to get their hands on the case and when they open it they find the piece of the algorithm. Now the protagonist has no idea what this is but he knows it's not plutonium and he knows it's something that Sato definitely uh, shouldn't have his hands on. But as they try to get away, objects start moving backwards around them and an inverted Sato appeals, asking the protagonist to give him the case or he'll shoot Cat. The protagonist is able to fool Sato by giving him an empty case and then they try to all to escape. But Sato again was one step ahead. This is because he uses what is called a, a temporal pincer movement, in which basically half of the team travels forwards and half is inverted. Basically, they exchange information along the way from different points of time, so they're always ahead of everybody else. Half his team moves forward through the event, he monitors them and then attacks at the end moving backwards, knowing everything. So Sato gets Cat and the protagonist back in the freeport, starts shooting at Cat and demands the protagonist tell him where the case is. Uh, the protagonist lies, uh, telling him it's uh, back in the car, and he is luckily saved by uh, an army team, presumably part of the tenant's organization. Unfortunately, Sato manages to sneak away and Kat is gravely wounded as she was shot by an inverted bullet and she is dying very rapidly. The protagonist makes one last attempt to stop Sato from getting his hands on the case by inverting himself and going back to the car chase moment, but uh, Sato notices him and stops him by trying to set the car on fire. Now, uh, luckily, excuse my lack of scientific terminology, but luckily in, when you're inverted everything works the other way around. So basically the fire of the explosion turns to ice and the protagonist survives. Sator eventually gets his hand on the algorithm, but luckily in all of this chaos the protagonist at least managed to put a tracker on the case. At this point the protagonist is pretty furious with Neil. Why does he always seem to know everything without telling everything? Who are these army guys? Did he say something to Sato and betray them? Neil says that if they make it out alive, he will explain everything, but there's no betrayal, just Sato is always a step ahead. So what to do next? Cat is dying, so they decide to reduce the spread of the damage caused by the inverted bullet by going back in time until the wound is in a manageable condition. But going back in time isn't just that simple. There aren't just uh, uh, turnstiles laying around everywhere, and most of them are owned by Sato and heavily guarded, until they remember the one in the Freeport in Oslo, which definitely wasn't guarded a week earlier with the huge plane crash situation and gold bars on the tarmac. So Neil and the protagonist take Kat back through the turnstile and all the way to the Freeport in Oslo. Now, something in the logistic goes wrong and they're not taken all the way inside the building, they're left outside on the runway. So Neil waits outside with Kat while the protagonist runs in uh, to clear the way. When he enters the building and passes through the turnstile, he meets himself and Neil in the past on their first time in the Freeport. He was that guy they met running out of the turnstile. Remember Neil said not to shoot him? That's because the protagonist was about to put a bullet through his own head. Neil's philosophy in general is that what's happened happened and that you can't tamper too much with the course of events or put too many ideas in somebody's mind. And also sometimes it's just easier to let things go as they should and not try to explain something which would only create even more confusion. Imagine somebody suddenly said, telling you, um, by the way, that person you're about to shoot is yourself coming back from the future to save you. Anyway, the protagonist manages to fight his way through the freeport. Neil brings Kat in, they go through the turnstile and come out with a significantly uh, less damaged bullet wound. Yay! But the protagonist definitely wants some answers from Neil now. Neil explains a lot about Tenet and about inversion and about how small objects don't create much damage, but how they are going against the natural 
natural flow of things. The more you invert and the more unstable the environment becomes. He also tells the protagonist about the plan future humans have to invert the whole world and wipe us out. And here the protagonist correctly brings up the grandfather paradox. The fact that they're killing us in the past, does that mean they're killing themselves in the future? After all, we're their ancestors. And also the fact that we're here now speaking about this and doing this, doesn't it mean that their plan failed? And also, isn't that a huge spoiler for the film? After all, it, it means that they, they successfully completed the mission. Neil appreciates the input and says, yes, optimistically that would be the outcome. But he also says that with multiple realities, it's hard to tell. What I think he means is that first we need to get our hands on that algorithm and stop them from actually carrying out this plan. And it's also, it's just a paradox of consciousness and uh, fate is reality. You might say it's fate that you met somebody you loved or or uh, bad luck that a pigeon pooped on your head, or coincidence that you chose the right lottery numbers. But that's just reality. A, a certain set of, of actions brought you to be in the correct place at the correct time. If somebody had told you to behave differently, your reality could have been different. Maybe the pigeon didn't poop, but you were run over by a car. There are multiple realities that could occur. Anyway, Neil's point is uh, future humans aren't bothering about the grandfather paradox. They want to kill us and we have to stop them fast. The protagonist decides to speak to Priya again, as she definitely knows more than what she's letting on. And she could also change the outcome of events. For example, traveling back in time and and not encouraging the protagonist to help Sato recover some plutonium. But Priya isn't exactly on the good team, and she's also of the idea that you shouldn't really tamper too much with the course of events and people's choices. But at the same time, she agrees that if the mission is successful, she will not uh, kill Kat and her son as a way of tying up loose ends, as l least people know about, the less people know about this, this whole situation, the better. And she also explains that to fight fire with fire, she has her own turnstile and they can use it to defeat Sator. The track of the protagonist put on the case points to Stalsk 12, Sator's childhood home in Russia, where he has completed the algorithm and hidden it away in a cave, ready to be deployed. So the team travel to Stalsk 12, ready for the final battle. And this is where all the pieces come together. Sato is dying. He has an incurable disease and so he doesn't really care about whether the world is coming to an end or not. On the contrary, the fact that he can help with doing this makes him feel a little like a god. And he's not going to wait for the people for the future to decide the moment. He has created a dead man switch, meaning that if he dies, everybody else has to die. Possibly on a specific happy moment he picks, which the Tenet team agrees could be uh, the last happy holiday he had with his wife. So the Tenet team agree that Sato should go ahead and die or kill himself, but they'll just remove the algorithm from all of that. So he will die, but not bringing the rest of the world with him. Um, basically, there will be an explosion, but he will not be connected to a huge deadly master plan. Only very selected people are sent in the cave to retrieve the algorithm, uh, the army leader Ives and the protagonist, because uh, whoever gets their hand on the algorithm has to stay there. Um, it's too much power in one man's hands. In the meanwhile, the rest of the army will be split into two teams who will be using Sato's same temporal pincer movement, benefiting from the knowledge of the other inverted team along the way. And of course, keeping Sato's guards off until the algorithm is recovered. In the meanwhile, Kat goes back in time to Sato's last happy moment, uh, the holiday together, and she tries to buy as much time as possible as it really looks like he's going to pick that moment to end his life. He even shows Kat um, a suicide pill he recovered from the CIA. Now, remember, those pills didn't actually work, but knowing Sato's evil mind, he probably had like 20 other backup plans. Anyway, the protagonist and Ives enter the cave to recover the algorithm, but there's not much time left. Sato's onto them and soldiers are already preparing the explosion. But suddenly, uh, one of the soldiers laying on the ground dead stands up as if he were 
inverted or reverted and he allows he sacrifices himself and allows the protagonist to get in and stop the algorithm in time and make it out behind before the explosion happens they actually barely make it out in time because cat um wasn't able to fake it much longer and she and she shoots uh, Sator, but luckily they make it out. At this point, the protagonist meets Neil and realizes that he was the soldier who saved them. He also realizes he himself will be the guy who will create Tenet, who will found it. He realizes the two will do so much together, he just doesn't know it yet. Neil walks off, possibly to go back in the cave and invert himself and sacrifice himself, and the other two guys split the algorithm and they promise that they will hide it somewhere safe and if necessary they will kill themselves. The protagonist eventually goes on to create in Tenet and he also becomes a sort of um, protective angel over Kat. For example he saves her from being killed by Priya who didn't uh, keep up her promise and was trying to uh, clear loose ends. The plot ends here uh, although there are still quite a few interesting concepts. One popular theory is that Neil is Kat's son. As they are the only two blonde posh British characters, Neil is very caring towards her, he knows exactly the date of Sato, his father's death, and we know that the son is called Maximilian, or the correct spelling would be Maximilian, which uh, spelled backwards is Neil. Now names are never random in the Nolan universe. In Inception, which is all about dreams, the characters' names form the word dreams. The woman who creates the mazes in the film is called Ariadne, who in mythology was always associated to mazes and labyrinths. In The Prestige, which is all about magic, the protagonists are called Alfred Borden, Robert Angier, which spell Abra, as in Abracadabra. In Interstellar, there is a whole scene dedicated to explaining why the protagonist's daughter is called Murph. In Insomnia, the protagonist is called Will Dormer, a name which in many languages means to sleep. So it wouldn't be too extreme to say that Neil could be Maximilian the son, although uh, that would mean that Neil would have had to spend at least 15 years inverted with no oxygen. I think it's more of Nolan prodding at our curiosity. There is probably a lot more to speak about, so make sure to leave a comment down below with your thoughts. Let's keep on the discussion there. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.